as you know if you've been following along with me. We're in the book of Genesis, chapter 6. We're at the point right before the great flood breaks out, where, according to the texts, there are sons of God taking daughters of humans and producing these giants that are in the earth. And the earth, including the humans, are bringing about what Jahuwah says is ruin or error, destroying the earth by their choices. And so he approaches Noah and tells him that he's going to bring an end to the earth at that time because it has gotten out of hand. And so though he knows, according to the text earlier in Genesis in chapter 3, which I'm going to discuss tomorrow in a separate show, Jahuwah promised a seed that would come and crush the serpent who, together with our first human parents, brought about error into this world. But because it's reached such a point now during the time of Noah, far beyond what Jahuwah wanted to occur, he's going to restrict it and bring about an end to this time, carry Noah through it, and then repopulate the earth's humans and animals. So let's consider the account. As you know from our last video, we discussed how the animals that Noah is told to bring into the ark, the specifically described ark in terms of dimension, size, height, width, other features, wood, the type of wood that should be cut and fit and overlain with waterproofing material like we use today, bitumen, so he's given instructions to build the specific ark, a replica of which we have in Kentucky today, which may be uh, identical in most respects, but probably maybe not all in terms of the exact features that Noah built into the ark. But it's similar enough in size and scale to, to give us an idea of what was possible. And as I've explained before, during this time, we have places being built out of solid stone, like the Yonaguni Monument off the coast of Japan, Gobekli Tepe itself, which we reviewed last time, in association with the animals, as I mentioned, the three specific classes of animals, land animals, crawling creatures of the earth, and birds of sky heaven. Noah is told to bring in not just two pairs, but nine pairs. Nine pairs, which are seven pairs of clean and two pairs of unclean birds, which will also then facilitate the restoration of seed and trees on the earth, which is what they also do today, but also of the land animals, seven clean and two unclean. And then the crawling creatures of the earth aren't given that specific pairing requirement, probably because of the differences involved with their cycles of reproduction and those of the birds and land animals. But either way, they're included in terms of the pairing and the preservation into the ark. The only excluded category are the ocean or aquatic creatures, which obviously are still able to be preserved by Jahuwah in accordance with the pairings that he wants during the flood. So now we're at the point where Noah has built the ark. He's gathered together, or the animals, as the text said previously, have been brought to him. And we're right at the point before the flood begins. Jahuwah gave Noah a period of time which we define loosely as between years and decades within the 100-year period of time that we can establish between Genesis 5.23 and Genesis 7.6, which we're going to read in a moment. So we have all these things set up for us now. We're right before the flood actually breaks out. Let's see what happens. Genesis chapter 6, we're going to be reading verses 6 through 16. I'll read the Hebrew translation followed by the Greek. I'll break at times to make a few comments, but at the end, we'll go back through and talk about key points in the material. Genesis 7, verse 6, Hebrew translation. Now Noah was a son of 600 years when the flood had come into being, waters against or over the earth. Verse 6, Greek translation. When Noah was 600 then the cataclysm came into being, water over the earth. Verse 7, Hebrew translation, Then Noah and his sons and Noah's woman and the women of his sons began to enter with him into the box vessel because of the appearance of waters belonging to the flood. So at this point, 
there's now starting to appear waters that become associated with the flood that aren't associated with waters existing during that time, which would include, of course, the waters on the surface of the earth and likely the mist that went up and watered the garden during the time of Adam and Eve before the text says it actually rained. So we have the waters that are above the portion of, exp of the expanse that separates the waters on the earth and above the earth. And so whatever system of watering was in place at this time in Noah's day, wa additional water belonging to the flood starting to appear. It hasn't broken out just yet. But it's starting to appear in verse 7. Let's look at, the, look at the Greek translation. Verse 7. But Noah and his sons and Noah's woman and the women of his sons entered with him into the wooden box craft on account of the water of the cataclysm. Verse 8. Hebrew translation. From the clean land animals and from the land animals which are not clean and from the flyer and from everything which is crawling upon the ground. Verse 8. Greek translation. From the birds and from the clean pack animals, and from the pack animals which are not clean, and from all the reptiles, those which are upon the earth. Verse 9, Hebrew translation, a pair, a pair had come into Noah, into the box vessel, a male and a female, just like that which God had ordered Noah. Verse 9, Greek translation, a pair, as a pair they entered into Noah, into the wooden box craft, a male and a female, just as God had commanded him. Verse 10, Hebrew translation, then it started to happen. Remember that expression. After seven days, waters of the flood appeared against the earth. Verse 10, Greek translation, after seven days, it began. Remember that expression. And the water of the cataclysm came to be over the earth. Verse 11, Hebrew translation, in the 600th year, a year according to the life of Noah, in the second month, in the 17th day of the month, this is when all of the water sources of the great abyss were cut apart. Windows of the sky heavens were opened. Verse 11, Greek translation, in the 600th year during the life of Noah, on the 27th of the second month. During this day, all of the water sources of the abyss were broken apart and the downward gates of the sky heaven were open. So you notice here there is a 10 day difference in uh, the Hebrew and Greek text in terms of the day on which the flood occurs. The year in terms of the life of Noah and the month are the same, but there is a 10 day difference in the Greek and Hebrew text. Not, not a significant difference, nothing that, that would disrupt any kind of chronology but something worth noting nonetheless. And then both texts in verse 11 specify that the water sources of the great abyss were cut apart. Let me go ahead and uh, I'll put that in red. And windows of the sky heaven were opened. I'll put that in blue. And the same here, the water sources of the abyss were broken apart. Put that in red. The downward gates of the sky heaven were opened. We'll put that in blue. Now let's continue with our reading. Verse 12, remember I told you to remember the first part of verse 10, then it started to happen. This is repeated because of the significance and the uniqueness of the rain event, which doesn't appear to have happened prior to that time. And so then it started to happen, verse 10. Then it began. Now verse 11, it started to happen. The rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Verse 12, it began to occur. Rain over the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Verse 13, during this very same day, Noah had come into the box vessel and Shem, Ham, and Japheth, sons of Noah, and Noah's woman and the three women of his sons, went in with him. Verse 13, Greek translation. In this same day, Noe entered into the wooden box craft, Sem, Ham, and Japheth, sons of Noe, and the woman of Noe, and the three women of his sons went in with him. Verse 14, Hebrew translation. They entered the box vessel, as did every living animal, by its type, 
and every animal by its type, and every each creature that is moving upon the ground by its type, and every flyer by its type, every bird, everything with a wing. Verse 14, Greek translation, all the animals according to their type, and all the pack animals according to their type, and every reptile moving upon the earth according to its type, and every bird according to its type. Verse 15, Hebrew translation, they started to come into Noah, into the box vessel, pair by pair, from all that is flesh in which there is a breath of life. Verse 15, Greek translation, they entered with Noe into the wooden box craft, pair by pair, from all flesh in which there is a spirit of life. Verse 16, Hebrew translation, our last text of today's day text. The ones coming in were male and female from all that is flesh. They had come in just like God had commanded him. God, Jehovah, then began to close up the box vessel behind Noah. Verse 16, Greek translation of our last part of our day text today. The ones entering the wooden box craft were male and female. From all flesh, they entered just as God commanded Noe. Then Lord God, Jehovah, shut the wooden box craft outside of him. That's interesting, you know. You know, it could have just said that Noah closed the, the box craft, but it doesn't because Noah and his family were there and they watched as the God Jehovah closed the door of the wooden box craft and they wrote down that he's the one who closed it. It's very, it's a small detail, but significant, right? Closing the door. But Jehovah's the one that they said did it. And that must have been really something special, if not terrifying. So now Noah has entered into the ark with his family, all the animals that Jehovah brought to him and that he collected, and that it appears he actually built locations like Gobekli Tepe to house them in, for them to reproduce in, until this day arrived. Entered into it, and Jehovah closed it. Now, if you'll notice back in verse 11, it says that the water sources of the great abyss were cut apart. Or according to the Greek text, they were broken open. So we have the downward gates of sky heaven, now obviously pouring rain down. We have the waters above the expanse and below the expanse. But the waters above the expanse at that time had not actually been used for the purpose of rain. So they were obviously serving some other kind of condition. Probably similar to today in terms of the the weather events on the earth, but just different. Just not involving the regular cycles of rain up until this time. But then it mentions these, these water sources below the earth. So we can see how those alive during Noah's day would have seen the water coming down from the heavens, just like we see today. And just like I've discussed in prior day tech shows involving the Genesis accounts of the firm expanse and the waters above and below the expanse that separates them. There are millions of pounds of water in these clouds. And the reason they're able to carry them, or one of the reasons is they're spread out over such a distance that their weight is distributed in such a way that the, the actual volume of water they contain does not weigh them down. In fact, they're often even lighter than air. This is the wisdom of Jehovah and the systemic genius that he put in the earth's cyclical events. So we, we can see the rain. We recognize it as it occurs today. Only back then it likely would have happened in a higher rate, we believe. Um, but maybe, maybe it was the same or similar. Um, at a minimum, it would be like we see today, but over a 40-day period, which would be extensive. And together with the waters that are already on the earth, now we have... 40 days of continuous rain from the waters that are above the earth, as well as something no one alive at this time would have known about unless they actually saw it start to appear. And that is water from deep within the earth. There's no way they would have known 
that there was massive amounts of water, just as much, if not more water underneath the earth than is on it. Let me share with you a few items in that regard. So here's an article from New Scientist from June 7, 2017. There's as much water in Earth's mantle as in all oceans. And we're just going to read this brief part here. It says, The deep Earth holds about the same amount of water as our oceans. That's the conclusion from experiments on rocks typical of those in the mantle transition zone. A global buffer layer, 410 to 660 kilometers beneath us, that separates the upper from the lower mantle. Let me see if I can get this a little bigger and fitting on the screen for you. Uh, I may not be able to get it all on there, but I'll put a link in the description below. But that's a little bit better in terms of the uh, text. So let's read a couple more paragraphs. Now this, this part here where he says that's the conclusion. This article is written in 2017. He, the, the article is based on information written in 2014 or presented in an article in 2014 right here. Um, it's available online through um, specific services that you have to sign up for. This article from Science, June 13, 2014, Volume 344, Issue 6189, pages 1265 to 1268. I'll put the, the description of the article in the, uh, or, uh, yeah, I'll put the description of this article in the description below because I can't link to it. Not the copy I had to get by signing up um, to a service. So whether or not you're able to get it or not um, by signing up or not signing up, that will be something for you to check into. But let me just share a couple points from this article here and we'll get back to the 2017 article and some others. So this 2017 article in New Scientist, it's referring to the studies, conclusions drawn in this article. Dehydration melting at the top of the lower mantle. And the, um, the, the various individuals are listed here who are involved with it. I'm just going to read a couple points. We'll get back to the other article. Um, I don't want to get too deeply into this article itself because it's more technical than some of the other articles that are written about the conclusions that are reached here. But I do want to share a couple points. It says cycling water through the transition zone. The water cycle involves more than just the water that circulates between the atmosphere, oceans, and surface waters. It extends deep into Earth's interior as the oceanic crust subducts or slides under adjoining plates of crust and sinks into the mantle, carrying with it water, or carrying water with it. Schmidt et al. combined seismological observations beneath North America with geodynamical modeling and high pressure and temperature melting experiments. They conclude that the mantle transition zone, 410 to 6 60 kilometers below Earth's surface, acts as a large reservoir of water. And then the first paragraph after the abstract, just the first um, couple sentences, or it looks like one long sentence. The water content of the upper mantle as sampled by mid-ocean ridge basalts is 0.005 to 0.02 weight percentage. But a potentially much larger deep reservoir of water may exist in the mantle transition zone between 410 and 660 kilometers depth, owing to the one to three weight percentage H2O storage capacity of the major mineral phases, wade slite and ringwoodite. Okay, so you have the amount of water content that they're, they're um, gauging based on sampling in the upper mantle, but then an even potentially larger, uh, deeper reservoir of water in the mantle transition zone. And that's where they get into the area between 410 and 660 kilometers, which brings us back to this article that talks further about it and not as technical of a, of, a, of a way so that we can just grab the main points and I can put a few links below besides the article that I had to subscribe in order to, to get to, the one I just showed you, the one in 2014 uh, on which a lot of this information is based right here. So then a couple years later after that article was written, this article represents what we just read, that the deep earth holds about as much water as our oceans. And then it says, if our estimation is correct, it means there's a large amount of water in the deep earth, says Hong Zhan Fei at the University of Beirut in Germany. The total amount of water in the deep earth is nearly the same as the mass of all the world's ocean water. 
The results add to mounting evidence that there is much more water than expected beneath us, mostly locked up within the crystals of minerals as ions rather than liquid water. But once that melt, as we'll get to in a moment, it turns into water, it comes out as water. At least one team has previously discovered water-rich rock fragments in volcanic debris originating from the mantle. Another group has conducted experiments suggesting that the water at these depths was formed here on Earth rather than being delivered to the primordial, primordial planet by comets and asteroids, which is their other lame theory with no evidence whatsoever that comets and asteroids brought all this water to the Earth. Now they're actually recognizing what the Bible stated was the case thousands of years ago. Jahuwah made the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void with water over the abyss. Water covering the entire surface of the earth. It was there from the beginning. And that's the conclusion they're now reaching. The vast amount of water locked inside rocks of this deep region of the mantle will certainly force us to think harder about how it ever got there. Or perhaps how it could have always been there. Since, sol since solidification of the mantle, says Stephen Jacobson of Northwestern University in Illinois, who wasn't connected with the new research. It's a key question about the evolution of the earth, which extends to extrasolar planets as well. No, not really. It's the question about the creation of the earth. They always default to this lame view of evolution, which contradicts all science, which is not consistent with what we observe at all in terms of reproduction and life. And they can't explain anything. I mean, their theory about the comets and asteroids bringing it here was lame to begin with. And then now they're just suggesting it as a part of an evolutionary aspect of the Earth that developed during its accidental solidification is, is equally retarded, right? I mean, they're just, they're, they're just grasping at the most remotest possibility. And it's not even remote because it's not even possible because it's based on no evidence. And yet they continue to push it forward in place of what the evidence does point to. Eternal intelligent life who gave life to all other life and who did all these other systemic and perfectly designed things. All right, let's take a look at another article on which the research from 2014 is based. So this from The Hunt for Earth's Deep Hidden Oceans in Quantum Magazine by Marcus Wu, July 11, 2018. Water bearing minerals reveal Earth's mantle could hold more water than all its oceans. Researchers now ask, where did it all come from? See, so the comet and asteroid theory is out the window. All this water underneath the earth now has to be explained. And what did we read in our day text, Genesis 7, 11? They knew all the way back then, without even doing any of this scientific study. They knew because they saw it happening. It started to occur. It started to happen. The deep sources of water broke apart. They were cut apart by Jahuwah and floodwaters started to appear. It's like an incredible hydraulic system that the earth can be submerged and then made dry again to the extent that Jahuwah wants. He can do it from above. He can do it from below. Everything Jahuwah does is perfect and he's in control. So these theories and things that these people put forward, they've never really been based on a credible analysis of the facts. It's been their theory and then they go after that. So they believe somehow the water got here from outer space. So they've been sticking with that until what? They find all this water underneath the earth. Now they can't claim it comes from outer space, at least not the way they previously claimed. So they're contradicted on a regular basis and their theories go right out the window. But the damage is usually done. They've usually misled so many people by that point with these idiotic theories of water being carried to us by asteroids and comets and being placed in the locations it's in and being able to survive all the heat of space in ways that would allow the water to even get here and form. They don't really ever explain anything beyond just a very fancy sounding theory with technical terms that's never justify, justified based on the actual science. Let's take a couple, uh, a look at a couple paragraphs in this article. So in 2014, referring again to the article that I've referenced earlier, in 2014, researchers glimpsed something embedded in these minerals that, if not for its deep origins, would have been unremarkable. Water. Not actual drops of water or even molecules of H2O, but its ingredients 
atoms of hydrogen and oxygen embedded in the crystal structure of the mineral itself. This hydrous mineral isn't wet, but when it melts, water or outspills water. The discovery was the first direct proof that water-rich minerals exist in this deep, between 410 and 660 kilometers down, in a region called the transition zone, sandwiched between the upper and lower mantles. And here's a picture of a diamond with that um, water-bearing mineral, ringwoodite, or actually maybe even actual water attached to it. It says, since then, scientists have found more tantalizing evidence of water. So since the 2014 article, this article right here that I'll put in the description below, uh, uh, the description of it, you'll have to find it online or subscribe to a similar service as I did. After that, after that 2014 scientific study, in, in March of this year of 2018, a team announced that they had discovered diamonds from Earth's mantle that have actual water encased inside. Seismic data has also mapped water-friendly minerals across a large portion of Earth's interior. Some scientists now argue that a huge reservoir of water could be lurking beneath our feet. If we consider all the planet's surface water as one ocean, and there turn out to be even a few oceans underground, it would change how scientists think of Earth's interior. But it also raises another question, where could it all have come from? See, they're getting starting to figure this stuff out, even though the Bible explained it thousands of years ago and made connections with things like water deep within the earth that no one at that time could have known about. Now, let's read this article here, or at least just part of it, because it's, again, a, a less technical explanation of what the USGA, uh, USGS, United States Geological Survey, has stated with respect to fresh water. Not just ocean water, but fresh water underneath the ground. And so in this article here of March 14, 2018 by Sarah Malone, How to Find Underground Water in Sciencing, I'll put a link. According to the United States Geological Survey, there is more fresh water located underground than there is in all of the Earth's freshwater lakes and rivers. So we have more ocean water underneath the ground than in all of the oceans combined. We have more fresh water underground than all of the fresh water sources on, on, above ground combined. We have all of the water in the cloud layers, millions and millions of pounds. And we have the water that's frozen in the south and north polar regions. All of that water, according to the biblical text, covered the entire earth. We're going to get to that specific description and the extent to which it is said to have covered the entire earth in subsequent day texts. But getting back to our day text today, I want to make sure it's very clear that we understand that the things the Bible is talking about are in no way myth and legend. Every single thing it's been describing to this point, including the times before the creation of humans, has proven accurate. It has proven to be quote-unquote scientific in that what science shows would have been necessary is what happened. And it not only does it with things like the days and events of creation, but it gives us geographic and topo topographical information as it pertains to the location of places like Eden, the rivers that combine into one that flowed through it, the surrounding areas, and the different types of resources that they held. It also talks about things that wouldn't have been knowable from a geographic or topo topographical survey. The water beneath the ground, deep underground. It doesn't just say water right below the surface of the ground. The biblical text in Genesis 7.11 says, sources of the great abyss, deep underground. Well, that's exactly what every single article 
and study that we referenced and read just a moment ago said is the case that in the upper and lower mantles of the earth there is more water than in our entire oceans combined same with all of the fresh water so when the bible describes the windows of sky heaven opening and it raining for 40 days whereas it had not rained before and the great water sources of the abyss being cut apart or broken apart that's what it's talking about it's talking about things that jahuwah knew were in place that's why it can say it and be accurate about it just like in our last day text video where we discussed the animals that noah collected together or that were brought to him and that were also referenced again today well those animals those specific types of animals land animals flying animals crawling creatures of the ground reptiles are exactly what are shown on the stones at gobekli tepe within a few hundred miles of mount ararat where the ark eventually lands right in the era where no likely would have existed and kept these animals so see the bible over and over again provides us with accurate historical information that is unique in its descriptions from places like eden to the types of animals that were collected and housed together for years or decades while noah built the ark to the hidden sources of water deep beneath the earth that no one not even noah would have known about except jahuwah the one who told noah exactly what to do and who told noah exactly what he was going to do and here we see it being described by those who witnessed it right it started to happen it began to occur waters belonging to the flood appeared the water sources of the deep earth were broken apart and sky heavens the waters above the separation between the waters on the land rain down noah is now in the box vessel all the animals are in the box vessel we know that because the last text that we read said that jahuwah closed the door after them so we're going to read forward from here again starting tuesday and we'll see what takes place next tomorrow i'm going to upload a video that i'm going to premiere so that you should have an opportunity to participate with others live uh, cw jaw talk about genesis 3 15 and the seed that jahuwah promised before all these events once things started to go awry but now we see the way he will deal with things if they get too far out of hand and everything that is described is consistent with what we can show was the case from the animals to the water sources even the lives of people that are said to have existed during this time are consistent with other records and ancient sources that we discuss, such as the Mahabharata and even in some respects, the Sumerian Kings lists. So I highly recommend once again that you stay with us in these day text readings. We'll get back to them starting Tuesday. I'll upload the CW Jaw Talk video on Genesis 3.15 tomorrow. Monday, I'm going to take off. But we'll be back to our day text starting Tuesday as we resume our readings in Genesis.